Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another segment of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions for Jane, and I'm really excited about our presentation today. It's really part three of our uh, three-part uh, fertilizer series. Now, uh, believe me, if you didn't see one and two, you know it's not a pre requirement, but uh, if you want to go back and see those, they are on the training page at uh, Jane's USA and you can check them out after. But, um, you know, we got started on this fertilizer discussion one day, uh, Eric Olson and I were just talking about fertilizer and, and it was interesting, the more we talked, the more I learned that I didn't know, right? It's really a complex uh, subject. It makes a big difference for your farm or for your garden. And uh, as we started to get into this, uh, I could see that Eric was great about explaining this in a way that was easy to understand. So we kind of brainstormed about this three-part series. And here we are now down to uh, uh, part three. And some of the things we've learned, right, is that uh, the fertilizer efficiency, especially when it comes to nitrogen, is, is very low. So uh, we're learning about ways to increase that uh, efficiency. Uh, and we're really lucky to have Eric Olson helping us do this. Uh, you know, Eric's uh, been involved in agriculture his entire life, uh, really knows uh, irrigation, of course, very well, but uh, a lot of people don't know he's a chemical engineer as well. He uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in chemical engineering, and, uh, you know, that's arguably the top program uh, around the nation. Um, and then the other thing that uh, makes the difference for me, especially when it comes to Eric, you know, Eric and I met, uh, we were both on the board of directors for the Irrigation Association. Eric was the president. And I started to see the side of Eric where he really likes to give back to his community, back to his industry. You can see he was an I, a board member for many years, uh, president, of course. He's involved with the Irrigation Innovation Consortium now. Uh, he helped start the Blue Tech Valley uh, uh, program there in Fresno. He's on the Fresno State University uh, Water Advisory Committee and many, many more. You ask people what they do or you look at what people do with their spare time, you find out a lot about the people. So uh, that's, uh, we're really fortunate to have Eric uh, talking to us uh, here about fertilizer. So Eric, welcome, how, how are you today? I'm doing great, thanks Richard, appreciate the intro. Yeah, now Eric, you've, uh, you've been really busy lately and uh, I see besides doing our Lunch and Learn today, uh, you're part of the first ever agricultural irrigation summit that the IA is putting on next week. Yeah, I'm I'm on a panel with uh, four other or three other uh, CEOs from the the uh, from the company member companies of the association, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. We get to talk about the irrigation industry. The conference this year it's it's not going to be in person, so it's a virtual conference. So. Now this panel is pretty pretty interesting that we're going to get to have a have an hour to talk about the state of the state and the business of uh, irrigation. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, so am I. That's going to be uh, Thursday, November fifth, uh, eight o'clock to three thirty Eastern time. So it'll start uh, on the West Coast the earlier time, eight o'clock in the morning, run through about uh, lunch thirty, twelve thirty there. And uh, boy, I know you guys are going to be talking. I know there's going to be some growers who have used ag technology that are going to be talking, and then we're going to see some presentations on some uh, irrigation technology for agriculture as well. So what a great day that's going to be. So anyway, uh, look forward to seeing you next week on that, Eric. I do want to put a, a plug for um, a web, web event also for that this Friday. Um, the chief operating officer of, of our distribution companies, John Topham, he is now the Irrigation Association president, and he's interviewing uh, some award winners and, and people that you know are really my mentors. Uh, uh, Stephen Stephen Smith and Brent Meekum are going to be interviewed by John Topham this Friday. So you can find these uh, details at the Irrigation Association website. I think it's irrigation.org, and they'll have that. But yeah, please tune in this Friday. Uh, morning to see John interviewing some of the you know amazing leaders in our you know, industry. So thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a great point. The Irrigation Association is doing a lot of great training right now, a lot of uh, information. So anyway, well let's uh, let's jump right into uh, part three here of uh, fertilizer. Now, if that's all right. Yeah, thank you. You know, part part three uh, in the first two parts, we really spent a lot of time focusing on uh, technology to help us manage fertilizer. 
and a lot on uh, nitrogen. And there's many more uh, nutrients that you know are, are critical to growing crops. And uh, you know, you can see the elements that I have here: phosphorus, potassium. We'll talk more in detail about those. And then we have these micronutrients. And so today's presentation will. Uh, uh, get into some specifics to help you. As Richard said, the fertilizer nutrient complex, you know, managing these nutrients is very complex. It's not easy to understand. If you had participated and joined us where we discussed, uh, you know, the nitrogen standpoint, it, it, that nitrogen process is super complex, and we have nitrogen changing forms uh, in the field or in your garden, and it's very difficult to understand, you know, that uh, nitrogen um, you know how much to apply and what form it is and what happens to it and a lot of there's a lot of good that can come from it and there's things that that aren't so good and you have to manage those so if you're interested and you want to go back and look at those webinars there's one on technology but just to kind of highlight the technology that we we showed or talked about there we have satellite imagery today that can help us manage uh, nitrogen we have uh, soil moisture sensors that can monitor how if the nitrogen is moving past the root zone. We have infield testing equipment, and then we also talked about coated nitrogen that's a slow release, because water moves, uh, fertilizer, this nitrogen fertilizer moves readily with water through the root zone, and that you know gives us some uh, challenges with environmental uh, issues. So uh, that, that was, those were the highlights of the technology there. You know, I stressed these uh, four R's of, of nutrient management in, in the fertilizer presentation, and those are, again, right source, finding the right uh, source of fertilizer, putting the right rate on, getting it on during the growing cycle at the right time, and then putting the, the fertilizer in the right place. We're going to talk today, you know, it's, it's different of where you want to put phosphorus compared to where you want to put nitrogen, and we're going to uh, talk about that. We did learn that if we have a poor irrigation distribution uniformity, it's going to lead to poor nitrogen use efficiency. And, uh, you know, in, in general, we are not doing a good job that the nitrogen use efficiency can be very low. And typically, we over apply the nitrogen because of these uh, inefficiencies in the system. So it's, it's our job as irrigators to make sure the distribution uniformities are as high as possible. Uh, to help us uh, grow great crops with a, a smaller environmental impact. We did learn that uh, nitrogen really can impact yield. It's, it's pretty highly correlated with improvements in yield, but we can't explain all of the variance. We gave examples where in certain countries there's the same amount of nitrogen uh, that's, or, well, there's more nitrogen that's used in another country, but we we have a huge difference in, in yield improvement uh, in the U.S. using less nitrogen. But in general, more nitrogen can lead to higher yield. And, um, but we have to be careful that if we use too much nitrogen and it goes to the groundwater, it goes to our water sources, and we have this eutrophication in the waterways and the, the greening of the rivers, streams, and, and oceans. So that's a huge issue. And it's a huge issue on uh, phosphorus, as we'll talk about in this presentation. Um, for many of the crops that you're growing, either in your field or in your garden, we have great places to go to for recommendations on how much either nitrogen or fertilizer to apply. Uh, you should learn those uh, sources, and, and uh, you can get your information there. And then we also learned about how to uh, read fertilizers um, labels as well, and I'll have a review of that. We spent the first two presentations really focused on technology and nitrogen, but you, you know, as you can see from this uh, uh, picture here, um, most people, most uh, literature says there's 16 essential elements to, to grow a crop or grow a plant. Some people say 17 and they add a micronutrient called nickel. Uh, some also say there, there's 18, but really the, the top nine are absolutely critical. You got the basic nutrients, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and then we have macronutrients, and the three primary macronutrients are what's used in the highest volume. But there are secondary macronutrients that are very important as well, called calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. These secondary macronutrients and the micronutrients listed below, a lot of times are available in your soil, so you don't necessarily have to, you know, put them on through fertilizers. Now, if you grow in a, in a soilless um, system, 
you will need to add these micronutrients. If it's indoor growing in, in a coconut husk uh, situation, you will need to add these micronutrients here. Uh, we're going to spend more time uh, today on phosphorus and potassium and trying to figure out how to get the right amount of those two primary macronutrients on. The prior presentations we did, as Richard said, focused on nitrogen and getting that right. If we do uh, get those big three right and we do soil tests and we can pay attention to calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, we're going to grow pretty good crops in a, in a manner that's okay for the environment. So Eric, I've got a couple quick questions about this and I want to remind everybody that you can ask questions either through the Q&A or through the Zoom webinar chat and I'll be um, passing those questions on to Eric at the appropriate times. But uh, my, my first question is this, I can get all those nutrients you were just talking about from organic fertilizer or synthetic fertilizer. Uh, does it matter which one I, I select? The you know, there are some um, challenges with uh, organic fertilizer and, um, you know, it depends on the source. Uh, you know, growing up in farming, we, uh, we were in beef, beef cattle and also poultry. And so we would often apply this organic uh, fertilizer to, to the land. You know, oftentimes, though, we didn't know actually what was in there. And you actually generate a lot of uh, organic fertilizer. And sometimes the benefits, you know, not as much as you think it is. And I think you had this calculation at one time, you know, how much nitrogen is actually in, in manure. And, you know, it, it's a lot, you know, in a ton of manure, you might only have 30 pounds of nitrogen. So you're going to need a lot of manure to, you know, get your garden uh, to where it needs to be or in, in the fields. And then you have this whole aspect about, um, when you apply manure, how you apply it, and what's the environment that you're applying it in. If you're applying manure in California, you know, it can be hot, dry, or windy. You know, nitrogen that you get from manure, it needs this really special environment, you know, kind of warm and moist so that the microbial action can work and you can get that nitrogen in the form of nitrate where the crop can utilize it versus, you know, we do not want to volatilize that. So, you know, I go back to my early days of, of farming and we used to spread manure in the field and we'd put a, a thin layer, we're using a spreader and it's blowing manure up in the air and then it's putting a, a fine mist of manure on. And, you know, today what I know is a lot of that benefit is volatiling off into the air and it's actually hurting the environment probably more than it's doing a good job. So. You know, organic fertilizers have their place. They do a phenomenal job, uh, but you really have to know what the sources, you know, of those micronutrients and these macronutrients are. You need to know the interaction of the soil and water and, and the uptake. And I think, you know, as we talk about these few fertilizers here, it'll, it'll become clear that, you know, you, you really, it's, it's easier and you get probably a better benefit to manage the situation by putting, uh, you know, the, these fertilizers here in, in a direct form. So um, talking a little bit about phosphorus and potassium, the other three, uh, the other macronutrients that, that are big, phosphate comes from a, a phosphate rock, and this is actually mined. Uh, the soils, ha actually most soils that we grow in have a lot of phosphorus in it, but it's in, it's a lot like nitrogen. It's not in the right form that the plant can use. Uh, the plants will take it in the, in those. You can see those that, that fourth bullet point there will uptake it in those those only those two forms, and that has to be in a soil solution. So a lot of times we'll look at the soil and get a, a phosphate test and see how much phosphate is in the soil, and it'll show that there's a lot, but it needs to be in that right form uh, for the crop to uptake, um, and that's that's a, an issue. Another issue or challenge with with uh, phosphate is it sticks in the top layer of, of the soil. And so unlike nitrogen that you know, moves with water, phosphate doesn't typically do that. It hangs up on the uh, soil particles and the clay particles on these cation exchange uh, sites. And so the risk with phosphate, and you see this, is the runoff. And the phosphates, if you apply too much on the surface and you get runoff in your field and this goes to the streams and lakes, 
that's what creates that eutrophication, the greening of those bodies of water. So, so you know, how do you get around this? Well, you want to knife in uh, phosphates, typically in, in the soil, to get them into the soil, to get them closer to the root zone so the plants can use that. Now, phosphate is interesting that it's got a, a very tighter range on pH, and it really does uh, well when the pH is between 6 and 7. But when pH gets a little higher, uh, say a pH of 8, you, ha you can have a problem with phosphate combining with uh, calcium or magnesium and kind of locking it up and making it as hard as a rock, and then it's not available to the plant. So that's a you know, big issue there. Um, you need phosphates for photosynthesis, the energy component, and, and transfer and respiration in plants. So absolutely critical uh, product. Very challenging to get it in the right form. Uh, most soils have enough phosphorus uh, in them to grow plants. Um, there's, there is a, um, an issue with, um, you know, these uh, uh, phosphates that are uh, there in, in, in the soil when we look at how much to apply. I'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a few more slides, but the, uh, the yield potential of, uh, that you get with phosphates, it's not like nitrogen where if I just add more nitrogen, I'm going to get a better crop. Phosphorus is, is tricky. Typically, if you put more phosphate, you, you're not going to necessarily see the yield impact, and that, that you know, causes further challenges. As a, as a farmer, you apply this and go, well, if I just apply more, it should be better, right? Not necessarily. So in many cases, uh, you're, you're just wasting money uh, with phosphorus. Now, potassium is a little bit similar. This is also mined um, in this uh, K, um, potassium oxide here, or the kind of the, the nickname for it is a myriad of potash. People hear potash all the time, and that's the kind of the slang name for it. But that, that's where we get the, uh, you know, the potassium comes. Again, this uh, potassium will be in this uh, potassium plus ion, and it, it, it kind of hangs up on these cation exchanges. It doesn't move through the soil that readily. It's not as challenging to get it into the usable form uh, like phosphorus, but, but there, um, there are, uh, you know, issues with it. It is in a lot of the soil, but maybe not all in the right available uh, format. So this is uh, interesting on both phosphorus and potassium. So we have now, a, how do we, yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, we have a question here, Eric, and uh, someone's asking about uh, good examples of uh, sources of uh, phosphate and potassium. Uh, yeah, the, the, for potassium, you know, the most common use of potassium is uh, potassium chloride, and it gives uh, the 60 percent. Uh, um, and so that's that's probably the best uh, source. There's uh, many different sources of, of phosphorus. There's a phosphorus that's you know typical in the West called uh, diammonium phosphate, and diammonium gives you some nitrogen in there, and that's the ammonium. And I have an example in that in a, in a few slides. But those are common, diammonium phosphate and potassium chloride. Those are good places to get your, um, you know, your potassium and phosphate. And you can see some examples here on this label. Just to go back and review this, if, if we have a fertilizer, general all-purpose fertilizer, and it's labeled 20, 10, 20, uh, that's percent, 20 percent, 10 percent, and 20 percent. And it goes in order of nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium in those forms that are uh, listed there. So if I have a bag of a 100-pound bag, I'm going to get 20 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphate, and 20 pounds of, of uh, this potassium form, potash, of 10 or 20, 10, 20. That's what I'm going to get, and that's how. So once I have that, then I, you know, I can figure out how much to apply. We did this calculation for nitrogen in our last. Uh, session. So I thought I'd do the same calculation uh, this time where I'm looking at potash and phosphate and how much to apply. So again, uh, if you're growing a corn crop, maybe you'd go to the University of Minnesota or University of Iowa State and, and they'll say if you're going to grow corn in this area and you got some givens, you know, I don't have any manure, I want 200 bushels an acre of corn, they're going to tell me how much nitrogen. I think our example last time said we needed to put 240 pounds an acre of nitrogen on. Uh, this, uh, I took 
the recommendation this time from another site, uh, Mosaic is a fertilizer uh, supply company, and it was uh, actually quite interesting as you, you know, I was preparing for this presentation and the research on recommendations for uh, phosphorus and potassium. There's quite a variation. It's not a clear-cut answer. You could go to five sites and get five different answers, and it's because uh, phosphorus and potassium are in the in the in the soils for, for most locations, and there's a reasonably abundant amount. So then you start to look at well, when I remove the crop, how much phosphorus am I removing out of the field? How much potassium am I taking off? And then the kind of the rule of thumb is well, I just need to apply that back in. So I would say Mosaic says for growing 200 bushel corn in the Midwest, this is how much uh, phosphate they say is needed and how much uh, potassium, potash. Now, that may be high. It looks a little high compared to some universities. But the universities were saying, you know, you have this in the field. You're not going to get that much more benefit by applying so much more. And then you have this recommendation from a fer fertilizer company. It looks high, right? Now they're selling fertilizer, so I think, you know, you have to take all – uh, all these things into account. But for calculations, let's just look at this. And so if I'm going to put on phosphate and I'm going to use diammonium phosphate, and that is 18460, that means 18% nitrogen, 46% uh, phosphate that goes in. And I need 115 pounds, I divide it by 46. And I have to put on 250 pounds of diammonium phosphate per acre to get 200 bushels of corn. Now that assumes you got a soil test and and, uh, you know, you have, a, I guess, a reasonable amount, and you're just replacing the phosphate that the prior year's crop took off. And so for the calculation for potash, um, I have 265 pounds. I divide it by 0.6, and I have to put on that much um, potassium chloride to get that uh, phosphate uh, there. So that's kind of the uh, calculation. Now, we also did a calculation last time for, for almonds, my second favorite crop, and uh, we went to UC Davis last time to get the, um, I want to, you know, how much nitrogen to put on. I want a 3,000 pounds per acre, assuming I got the soil and the conditions to get that, which isn't, isn't easy. Uh, I, and I learned that, yeah, I want to put on um, urea ammonium nitrate, but I'm going to put it through my irrigation system. I've made a calculation here to try to simplify this because this is, uh, you know, people make it seem so difficult, but through a, a, a calculation here that I can just walk you through, I think anyone can figure out how much um, fertilizer to put through an irrigation system to spoon feed the crop so you're not uh, over applying nitrogen and, and wasting it because nitrogen moves through the with the water through the soil. So very important to spoon feed it through drip irrigation if possible. So in this calculation, if you remember, to get that yield, we needed uh, uh, 240 pounds of, of nitrogen put on, and I have UAN 32. That's 32 percent uh, nitrogen through uh, that urea. Uh, uh, fertilizer, and that says I need to put on 750 pounds an acre. And if you remember from last time, the fertilizer needs to apply when the, when the crop is really growing. You know, in that 70% of the window when it, it it's really moving and growing and changing, you don't need all of the fertilizer at the beginning of the year, and you don't need all of it at the end of the year when it's you know, getting close to harvest, but you, you want to have it, and you should put the nitrogen on a little bit before it's needed because, it, again, it moves through the soil, and, and there's it, all these interactions with the soil and the water that, that happen that sometimes make the nitrogen available or not available, and you want it to give a, the environment a little time to uh, help you. So apply it ahead. So if I'm going to, you know, irrigate, do my heavy irrigation over, say, 10 weeks, I, you know, these are the heavy times I want to fertigate, and I want to once a week fertigate. So I break this 750 pounds, and I divide it by 10 fertigation events. And these are, again, you know, following the, the crop growth curve of when the, the fertilizer is needed. And let's say I have a field of 40 acres, and it's split up into two irrigation zones. I irrigate 20 acres and 20 acres. I split up that way. So 750 divided by 10 fertigation events. You can see I need to put on 75 pounds of UAN per irrigation. And um, if I have to put on 
per irrigation event, 75 pounds, and one gallon of that material, if that weighs 11 pounds, I just divide divide by the you know the 11 pounds then, and I get the UAN. I need to put on 6.8 gallons per acre per every irrigation, and I'm going to do that 10 times over the over the summer. Uh, if I have this uh, UAN 32 for 40 acres, I'm going to need 272 uh, gallons. Uh, here for each of these uh, irrigation events, and I take that gallonage, multiply by the acres, divided by two irrigation sets, and I need 136 gallons per set. Now, how do you put that on is is also critical. Uh, you don't want to if it, let's say we have our irrigation system running 10 hours during this time, and would you want to put all the fertilizer on at the beginning, the end? Uh, or do you want to spoon feed it? If you want to spoon feed it, um, there's literature that says I should fertigate in the middle one-third of the irrigation cycle. Well, for here, I said, well, we're going to irrigate 10 hours. And so I said, we're going to put the fertilizer on in the middle eight hours, and we're going to run clean water through the first hour, fertigate for eight hours, and then run clean water through uh, the, the, the tail end. Now, why do I do that? Well, depending on what fertilizers, you don't want that uh, fertilizer hanging up in your drip lines. And if we have 40 acres, that might take 30 minutes, depending on the length of run of the pipe, to get the fertilizer all clean through the pipe. So before I fertigate, I want to get water all the way through the end. That might take a half hour, so I gave myself an extra half hour. Then I spoon feed the crop for eight hours. And then I flush the system for the last hour, and it might only take a half hour for the water to get out. And that would help us with the resonance time and the clearing of the fertilizer or chemicals, which you'll see in, in future slides can be uh, very important. So Eric, those uh, 10 fertigation events, they would be consecutive events uh, during the uh, highest or steepest growth phase of your crop? Yeah, you could do those, uh, you know, once a week, uh, fertigate one, once a week. Uh, you know, some people might uh, fertigate um, every, every uh, irrigation event and might do a little less. Um, it just depends what your setup is. And if you remember from the presentation we had last time, there's actually a lot of nitrogen in, in some of the groundwater. So you're getting that nitrogen on those other events. Uh, when, we're, when we're fertigating here, you know, you might be plying something else too. So you kind of take these things into a, in, an account. Yeah. Okay, so great. Thank how do we, yeah, so how do we get on that 17 gallons per hour uh, during the, the, those eight hours? Well, there's some really, uh, you know, really unique um, solutions here from a chemical engineering standpoint. You know, I love these uh, proportional uh, injectors and these, these uh, mazy injectors that use uh, pressure differential to suck fertilizer out of the tank, and that can be set up. That's what you're seeing on the left there. We use and sell Maisie injectors, and Maisie's got a phenomenal product here. And if you want to, uh, you know, go to their website at Maisie.net, uh, you can say, "Well, I need a fertilizer injector to get 17 gallons per hour," and they have a, an amazing. Um, selection tool to help you get the proper Maisie injector sized for the system to do that job. Um, a little bit more expensive would be these water-powered proportional uh, pumps on the right, right side of the screen there. I think that's a, a, a dosatron that uses kind of water power and a piston to uh, pump that, that amount on. And if you wanted to get a little bit more sophisticated and really automate it and have, uh, use a sophisticated controller, um, we have a product line called uh, NutriCare, and that can, you know, automate all of this for you. So you put in a schedule, and you kind of just let it go. You fill the tank of fertilizer, and you have a big tank, and it, it can just run that schedule the way you had to do it. Otherwise, you have some manual uh, work to do on this fertigation, which isn't, it, it isn't a lot, and it's not that difficult. But this automation, uh, you know, is pretty pretty special. So that NutriCare setup there is that little kind of box on the right. You can see there. There's uh, four little uh, valve control uh, columns there of uh, setting where you can set 
do the settings for the uh, you know three fertilizers and maybe an acid if you wanted to add there uh, you can add and and that will be mixed uh, that will pull in fertilizer from tanks outside this room and it'll go through the filter tanks there that are on the left and the controllers on the right side of the wall so uh, pretty sophisticated this would cost quite a bit more money than than those uh, Maisie injectors and um, I think you've seen other uh, Frank Toves from IDC. He, he does a great presentation on you know setting up this automation and, and control for us as well. So pretty uh, uh, complex. I think the calculations that we went through are, are pretty simple. But remember, you know we need to put nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We got to have those micronutrients, and we have all this chemistry happening in the in the soil. We got nitrogen moving through the soil with the water, phosphorus hanging up. How do we get all of that like together? Isn't there just one solution that I can pump through my system that has it all? Uh, not, not really, right? There's no miracle solution that gives everything you, you need. Uh, there, there's not a you know Kool-Aid for almonds that has everything in it, and so you have to then. Uh, you know, figure out some solutions that you, you might mix. So you might need a, a nitrogen fertilizer and you might need this diammonium phosphate. And if you, you know, mix those or, or you have stuff that gets mixed, would that be a problem? Well, the best thing to do is uh, combine these two fertilizers in what's called a jar test and you put them together and you see, you know, do, do, do things settle out? Does it coagulate? And you want to do this because uh, testing this in your drip system for incompatible fertilizers, you could plug up your drip systems and lose your investment. Uh, so that that is very important when you're considering any mixtures to do this uh, jar test. You should also um, put these fertilizers before your filters. The, the filters, you know, will will uh, if there's a problem and coagulates or chelates or any any issues like that, the filters. They're there to protect the drip system. You, if you have a problem, it's better to find it in the filter than a plugged up system in the field where there's, there's a whole bunch of issues. So, uh, you know, I'd always recommend injecting fertilizers upstream of the filters. Now, maybe if it's uh, acidic fertilizer or acids and you got metal uh, tanks, you know, this acids could be put after uh, the, uh, the fil filtration st uh, stations. But always uh, be careful on that. Um, you know, I talked about spoon feeding, uh, and you really want to match the rates. The example we did, you want to match with the crop demand. You want to know what's in the water. If you got perfectly clean water and you use the wrong fertilizer, it, you know, you can make cement uh, pretty easily. So there's a lot of a lot of tricks there. And then, um, you know, monitor the tissue and nutrient status. You know, you don't need to like pour the coals to the phosphorus adding it if, if, you know, the soil has enough phosphorus and the, the plants, you know, are not, are saying they have a high phosphorus, you know, you don't need to maybe put a lot of phosphorus. And anytime you're injecting uh, uh, these uh, chemicals or doing fertigation chemigation, you know, I'd recommend uh, uh, flushing the system. Corey uh, Broad's going to talk about flushing on Friday, and you're going to, not to steal the thunder here on that, but uh, it, it's very important to flush the, the systems, and Corey's going to kind of go through that in detail. Far too few people actually do that. A few other tips. I mean, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the safety aspects of fertigation, and it, it's, it can be pretty scary. I, you know, I'm a chemical engineer, and I'm still, you can be somewhat intimidated by what can happen. You've heard of these fertilizers, explosions, these accidents that happen, and you you want to be careful, so get help with uh, fertilizers and mixing and, and things like that. Um, number one thing is don't put, don't dump acid into water. Uh, what what happens is, you know, I'm sorry, always put acid into water. Don't dump acid in, into, or don't dump water into acid because you, you can literally get an explosion in a cloud. And uh, the, the same for uh, uh, chlorine. Um, you don't want to uh, put water into a chlorine solution. Put the chlorine into water. Uh, that, that's very important to get that right. Um, the injecting a fertilizer, I talked about that. 
you know, if you're, you're doing a dry fertilizer, mixing it with water, put put it in a drum and, you know, fill it half with water and then mix it and then fill fill it up the rest of the way. Um, and, you know, don't mix very concentrated fertilizers with other concentrated fertilizers. You just, you know, don't necessarily know what happened. But the picture on the right here, I wanted to show, it's a little bit hard to see, but let me let me get a pointer here and see if I can point that out. This is a sand media filter system. And can you see my laser pointer, Richard? Yeah, just great. Thank you. Okay, so here we have a, a Maisy injector and we got water water going in the in, into the filters. The water comes in and gets cleaned and then it comes out the bottom and then you'll have water coming out over here and you can see we're injecting something after the water comes out of the filters because the water is going to come out below these filter tanks. These are sand media tanks. And here you can see I got a Venturi and I'm injecting something. So this would be potentially injecting fertilizer after the filter tanks. You know, probably a no-no. Now if they're using this for injecting acid, that might be okay because you got metal tanks and the acid could be metal and it, it could be corrosive on your tank. So hopefully this is just for acid and not for fertilizer again. So this is you kind of things that you would typically uh, see. So wrapping it up here, there's a few more slides I want to talk about. So what, what happens um, if I do everything right and it's going along good? I think, you know, I followed all the things that my certified crop advisor tells me to do but my crop starts looking a little funky and I get, say, purple leaves or purple edge. Well, we all have this. We have this in our uh, garden. We have it in the almond orchard. And this happens to be uh, pictures of corn leaves, my first favorite crop. And so when you go through and look at this, this is a fertilizer deficiency or crop deficiency of these different nutrients, macronutrients and micro, some uh, micronutrients. And I really like this because the corn leaf, it's easy to see. If you're looking at sometimes almond leaves, it's very hard to see or other plant material. But the nutrients behave very similar in all types of different leaves. And so if you see purpling on the edge of the leaves, coincidentally, you know, that's a phosphorus deficiency. So you can remember phosphorus, purple edge, so now we can all become experts and go say, hey, you got a phosphorus deficiency here in your crop, right? So that's kind of uh, interesting. Nitrogen is also a common thing that's fairly easy to see. What you notice here is a yellowing down the middle of the corn leaf. And so this is very common. If nitrogen is not available, you're going to typically get a yellowing down the middle of the leaf. And that happens in a lot of different plant material. If I'm short on potassium, it's kind of the opposite. The yellowing happens on the outside, just like phosphorus. So think of potassium yellowing on the outside, phosphorus purpling on the outside. And with potassium also, you get this browning, right? So these are the top three. You're most likely going to get those right? We know what a drought looks like when it's really hot and it's burning up, the leaves kind of curl up and shrivel up. I think we've all seen plants in our garden with some you know, disease or issues that kind of looks like that. So, you know, we can be pretty good agronomists by just knowing the phosphorus deficiency, the potassium deficiency, nitrogen deficiency, you know, not enough water and disease, you know, that's, you know, not much to that. Now, a lot of other crop leaves are more difficult to see, and I love corn because it's kind of obvious of how to see it, uh, but these uh, traits are consistent with other plants as well. So, uh, in summary, uh, the fertilizer and nutrient management process, is, it's very complex about managing uh, nitrogen as it moves through the uh, soil with water, as phosphorus, as it you know, you got runoff issues and it, getting it into the soil and into the root zone is a challenge. Uh, it's, it's there. You don't have a huge yield response like you do with nitrogen. The nitrogen and phosphorus move around to all these different uh, 
uh, chemistry is and it's complex depending on the weather, the airspeed, the humidity, and the and the soil types. Very complex. So you know, g get help on this. It's not easy. Uh, we have uh, uh, two certified crop advisors in our in our company. We are the most certified company in the irrigation industry. We have certified ag irrigation specialists that can help you, certified irrigation designers. But get, get help on this. Your local universities, the extensions, your fertilizer suppliers, they can all help you uh, on this. I put below, again, my favorite references to that, that help me, and it's, these books are on my, anyone that visits my office, no, they always see these books there. I got them open, I'm always looking at stuff. And those are my favorite references below. I added one on micronutrients. We didn't spend a whole lot of time on micronutrients. A lot of the micronutrients are in the soil. The micronutrients are important. If you're doing uh, soilless agriculture, you're going to need to add those, and there are products available to help you get those. Again, utilize the available technology from satellite imagery, soil moisture sensors, in-field testing, or you know, slow release uh, if, if you, you know, can afford it for certain crops. The four R's again, you know, getting that right source. You can see how complex it is if you don't have the right source. If you use incompatible sources, you're going to have huge problems in your system and potentially lose your investment. You know, the right rate, getting all that nutrients in the, in the growth uh, curve of that, that crop is, is critical. The nitrogen and potassium typically follow a real tight window where, when the needs are the same. Phosphorus, the needs are a little bit earlier than, than nitrogen in, in many crops. You know, the right timing, you should think about how and when you want to apply it in the right place. Uh, nitrogen, we probably want to apply it at the surface because, again, it's going to move through the soil with water. Uh, phosphorus, we got to get it, you know, we might want to band it in, get it below the surface because it kind of hangs up there. If we put phosphorus at the surface, it might sit there and then run off. So you put all this phosphorus on and you didn't get any benefit. That's the right place that we're talking about. Potassium is very uh, similar to that. And uh, we're an irrigation company, so let's get those irrigation systems. Let's put in high-quality designs, high-quality products, and make sure our distributions are uh, – uniformities are high because poor irrigation, it, it's a poor – uh, fertilizer use efficiency, it has significant environmental impacts, and, and bottom line, you're wasting money as a grower, and we gotta, we got to help our growers. It's difficult enough being a, a farmer, uh, you know. So um, with that, Richard, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up and say thank you. I've enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for putting these on and hosting these. You do two a week. I don't know how you do it, but I'm really uh, happy you make it easy and, and, you know, make it so we all want to participate in this. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Eric. You know, I feel like I just had a, uh, a master's class with a three-hour investment of time, right? Seeing part one, part two, part three, uh, all for no charge, thanks to you and, and Jane Irrigation. So this was really great. I'm, I'm going to have much more meaningful conversations going forward about fertilizer. I know people uh, as a result of this. So this was just great. Uh, and then also thank you for reminding everybody, uh, Friday, we've got Corey Broad coming on. Uh, this Friday at uh, noon uh, Pacific Daylight Time, and he's going to be talking about uh, emission device and drip tape flushing, something that Eric was just mentioning. It was so important to do after you uh, fertigate. So uh, again, Eric, thank you to all the viewers out there. Thanks very much for spending uh, your lunch with us again. Uh, we know it's valuable time, and we appreciate the opportunity to bring you this uh, great education. I uh, hope you guys have a great uh, rest of your Wednesday. And uh, we'll see most of you on Friday then. Eric, thanks again. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate it.